Greetings. I am Walt Bauer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Human Development Institute's second fall webinar. We welcome all the participants who are joining us online. Our presenters will provide an opportunity for questions today, and we welcome questions from all of our participants. Please type your questions for our speakers in the Q&A box. Please use the chat box for technical questions. You are joining the webinar on mute and without video. There is not a partic participant video in the webinar room. We have live captioning for this webinar today. To turn on captioning, click the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen and then click show subtitle. Please take a moment at the conclusion of the webinar to complete our brief evaluation. The evaluation will be sent to your email address after the webinar. It is really helpful as we plan for upcoming webinars. Should you have questions about CEUs, you can contact me. My email address is walt.bauer at uky.edu. Again, that is walt, W-A-L-T dot B-O-W-E-R at uky.edu. The title of the webinar is The Impact of COVID-19, Considerations for Individuals with Developmental Disabilities Across Major Life Domains. It's a pleasure and a privilege to introduce our speakers today. Lauren Avalone is an assistant professor and research associate at the Virginia Commonwealth University's Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. Hannah Seward is a research associate at Virginia Commonwealth University's Rehabilitation Research and Training Center. I am now gonna turn it over to our presenters. Thank you so much. Uh, Lauren, could you advance the slide, please? So this presentation is based in part on an article that we co-authored in early 2020. We will go over a lot of what we talked about in the article and research that has come out since then, but I did want to let you know that the article is available free to read online uh, and you can read it yourself. Next, please. So um, as we know and likely remember very clearly, uh, COVID-19 was declared a global pandemic in March of 2020. There were a lot of unknowns at the time, but one thing was certain early on, and that was that individuals with underlying health conditions all faced an increased risk of more severe outcomes if they were diagnosed with COVID-19. We also learned early that individuals with developmental disabilities are a vulnerable, vulnerable group when it comes to COVID. Uh, what is especially concerning for persons with developmental disabilities and other disabilities is that they are also at heightened risk for contracting the virus in the first place and face some unique difficulties in receiving treatment. Next slide, please. Um, next, we will discuss the heightened risk factors that individuals with developmental disabilities face. Next, please. So many individuals with developmental disabilities require assistance in completing daily activities. They may rely on a family member or paid caregivers for support throughout daily tasks. Uh, in fact, research has shown that most uh, individuals with an intellectual or developmental disability live with a family caregiver. Um, and in receiving this assistance, the individual with a disability may need to violate social distancing guidelines and be in closer proximity to others who could be carriers of the virus. So they're not able to distance themselves in the same way that you or I might um, in order to get daily activities completed. 
So for individuals with developmental disabilities who may complete those daily tasks independently, they are often accustomed to completing these tasks as part of a structured routine. So uh, as we all learned, routines were completely <laughs> violated and upended um, and, and still are in many ways. So although the individual may be able to practice safe hygiene independently, they may not uh, independently increase safe habits to the frequencies that are recommended during the pandemic, such as the increased hand washing anytime you, know, you touched anything or went anywhere or the ability to adapt to do suggestions or follow local mandates that are always changing, such as wearing a mask in a public place, um, whether you're vaccinated or not. So therefore, they may be less likely to perform these skills and tasks outside of their typical routines and with enough diligence to sufficiently protect themselves from infection from COVID-19. Next, please. So if an individual with a developmental disability does contract COVID-19, the differences in communication can negatively impact the care that they receive. If the person is feeling ill, they may not have the language to articulate symptoms to others or respond accurately to standard screening procedures. They may not even know if they've been in contact with somebody or you know, be able to articulate um, the different questions and answers that are required in order to you know, track diagnoses. So this presents two major concerns. The first is the failure to seek treatment if and when they need it. Um, not going to the emergency room or not knowing who, who to talk to or who to ask um, if they feel sick. And then the second is the potential consequences of receiving inadequate treatment. So both of these concerns placed individuals with developmental disabilities at a greater risk of improper care inadequate care or a lack of care altogether. Uh, communication differences can lead to many inequities in healthcare treatment if professionals are unable to identify the ways to address these barriers for people with developmental disabilities. So although the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, also known as the ADA, requires governments, businesses, nonprofits to communicate effectively with those who display the differences in communication, not all places will have people who know how to serve the public and are trained how to alter language, use plain language, or use different communication platforms in order to meet the needs of people with disabilities. So in addition, many uh, healthcare facilities restricted visitors and are still restricting visitors during uh, the pandemic, uh, which leads to the unavailability of support persons in the healthcare setting, whether a family uh, member or um, more formal support. Um, they are unable to access the healthcare setting to assist with communication, or to help the um, individual navigate uh, the difficulties of the complex medical system. Next slide, please. So um, all people with serious underlying chronic medical conditions, such as chronic lung disease, a serious heart condition, or a weakened immune system, seem to be more likely to get severely ill from COVID-19. So in general, a high prevalence of underlying chronic, chronic medical conditions has been observed with individuals with developmental disabilities. So on a COVID-19 information webpage specifically written regarding uh, people with disabilities, the CDC um, says that adults with disabilities are three times more likely than adults with disabilities to have without disabilities, to have heart disease, diabetes, cancer, or stroke. So these coexisting medical conditions may be due to a myriad of factors, such as financial barriers to adequate healthcare, difficulties in navigating the very complex medical system, uh, effects of certain lifestyles might be more sedentary, medication side effects, lack of transportation to and from medical appointments, and other barriers. So individuals in general, um, individuals with developmental disabilities are less likely than individuals without disabilities to attend routine medical checkups and are therefore 
more likely to receive a diagnosis after the condition has become more advanced. So they're finding out about a coexisting medical condition at a later stage than maybe some of their peers without disabilities. So as a result, many individuals with developmental disabilities are likely to have or develop secondary conditions that compound the risk of experiencing more negative outcomes of COVID-19. Next, please. So health systems have certainly made some strides in attempting to meet the needs of individuals with developmental disabilities by promoting interdisciplinary healthcare services, educating healthcare providers on how to more effectively serve individuals with developmental disabilities. However, in the wake of a global pandemic that consumes resources beyond what is routinely expected or ever expected, there is the potential for progress to be set back. This can lead to serious implications for patients who have developmental disabilities. Uh, individuals with developmental disabilities may be unable or less likely to see their usual medical providers during this time due to travel or physical restrictions. This is really problematic because their regular providers may be more familiar with the communication style, health history, may be able to work with family members, um, have a long you know, uh, experience of their medical history and um, uh, communication style. Interdisciplinary team members such as advocates or liaisons may be required to work remotely, so they may not be available to support the patient with a developmental disability. And an additional difficulty is the move towards telemedicine during the pandemic. So a lot of us saw that telehealth services may replace in-person site visits to reduce the risk of exposure and allow these medical facilities to um, continue to you know, provide for sick in the office. But individuals with developmental disabilities may be unfamiliar and uncomfortable or unable to access these platforms, uh, which makes them more likely to be excluded from the necessary care that they need. As healthcare providers become overwhelmed and overworked during the global health crisis like COVID, uh, the resource of time become scarce and reading resources on the healthcare needs of those with developmental disabilities or finding alternative supports may become a lot less likely. There is certainly also the potential for discrimination and denial of medical treatment. Uh, individuals with disabilities have had a long pervasive history of discrimination. And even early in the pandemic, disability rights advocates have had to issue guidances to ensure that the states and providers maintain healthcare ethics and humanity during this crisis. So next, Lauren will discuss how COVID-19 impacts individuals with disabilities across various life domains. Thank you, Hannah. Um, so my name is Lauren Avalone, and I'm going to just go over a bit about some of the impact that the pandemic had on the different life domains for individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, certainly the pandemic caught everyone off guard, and there was a point in time where just about the entire world was scrambling to figure out how to address the impact. And because, as Hannah mentioned, individuals with developmental disabilities were disproportionately impacted, I really want to focus now on some of the ways that that is true in those different life areas. So I'm going to talk a bit about, my slide is not advancing, hold on just a second, there we go. Um, so some of the major life domains. And, Categorically, we could really delve into how to parse out different life domains, but I've just lumped them in, um, excuse me, four, four major categories, which are independent living, education, employment, and also health. And I do want to just point out that as a discipline, um, you know, we've made a lot of strides to really provide access to equitable services to individuals with disabilities. <clears throat> Hannah mentioned um, the Americans with Disability Act, 
We've also seen it in education with um, IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And then as, as recently as 2014, a major piece of legislation targeting equal access for, for work and also um, trying to open up more employment opportunities for individuals with disabilities. So WIOA, which is the Workforce Innovation um, and Opportunity Act. And so as a field, we've really tried to create a lot of um, a lot of opportunities, as I mentioned. And one of the, the major problems we saw with the onset of the pandemic is that with a lot of the supports and services that some of these pieces of legislation enabled, they weren't necessarily designed to be transferred to other contexts, which is exactly what happened when the pandemic hit. So some of the services that, for example, students were getting in education were not designed for home use. And so it didn't provide the type of support needed when suddenly moved into that different context. So I just want to highlight the fact that um, while we do have a ways to go in, in some respects, we have made strides, but we need to be a lot more vigilant as a discipline about how malleable um, those strides are and how they can really be applied in the event of a, of a crisis situation. And so as I talk today, I just want to invite all of you, and I don't know what all fields you represent, but um, it's my understanding that the audience is a wide array of stakeholders. So some of you are probably individuals with different disabilities. Some of you are probably parents and family members, maybe your vocational rehabilitation support service providers or educators, maybe your researchers or policymakers. I think that if we look at the bigger context of what we can accomplish, not just in this presentation, but um, as kind of a collaborative group of individuals working towards the same goal, is to really think about what we can bring to the table to iron out the conversation. So in the event of another crisis, we're better prepared to have less disruption in services for the individuals that we work with. So, Kind of keep that in mind as we go through. I'm going to talk a little bit about those different life domains. And we're not going to necessarily admire the problem here today, but I do want to delve into what some of those problems are. And in the latter half of this presentation, we'll get a lot more into some of the strategies that um, different types of entities are employing to combat some of the discrepancies we've seen in services. And then also, as Hannah mentioned, some of the initial research that's coming out. And I'll offer just a little bit of insight. Um, I work with a variety of ages and disabilities in a variety of contexts. So <clears throat> at my position, we do a lot of work in schools. We also work in employment. And so I'll just kind of briefly add in some of um, the things that I've, I've had as challenging during my experience. I also want to mention, I feel like I'm losing my voice. So if you're having a hard time understanding me, I do apologize for that. Um, okay, so back to life domains. The first one I'm going to focus on is employment. When the pandemic hit, um, individuals who were in entry-level positions were primarily most affected by the shutdown. So particularly in that, that initial phase, and by that I'm referring to really your job status, so that's whether or not somebody continued to be employed. And what we know from research pretty consistently throughout the decades is that individuals with developmental disabilities are disproportionately employed in entry-level positions. So they were among the most affected in terms of employment status. And they're typically employed, again, from the research we know in industries like leisure and hospitality, food and retail, um, the restaurant industries. And again, those are, when you look at the statistics, the industries that really were um, hit hard very early on and had many lingering effects in terms of continuing to employ people during the phases of the pandemic. So this really left a lot of individuals with dis developmental disabilities at a disadvantage financially. And so um, in order to 
float themselves, they had few options. They either had to rely more heavily on family members who were um, may or may not have also been financially impacted by the pandemic or alternately try and navigate complex unemployment systems, which requires a pretty um, extensive understanding of the process. It requires access to technology to be able to complete the paperwork needed. And it's also coming at a time where the system itself is just inundated with people who also need that level of support. So there was certainly delays um, in getting that. And consequently, the lack of income can really negatively affect anybody, but also people with developmental disabilities who, as we mentioned earlier in this presentation, have a higher risk of already having underlying health conditions. So if they were employed and had health insurance and then lost it, um, you know, there's a lot of kind of collateral damage that can happen because of that. And so I just want to sort of point out that in general, they were very highly impacted employment-wise by the pandemic compared to the general population. The second way that individuals with developmental disabilities were impacted in the employment setting refers to job supports. And by job supports, I'm targeting the services that an individual would need to be successful maintaining their employment. So while a number of individuals, in fact, the majority were affected job status wise, so they did not remain employed, they were either um, furloughed or lost their employment. There are a number of individuals, in fact, ones that I work with who ended up staying in um, essential businesses during the pandemic. So pharmacies, healthcare, grocery stores, and worked in entry level positions in these different um, organizations or businesses. And so that created a whole different type of challenge. So in the wake of all of the changes and regulations, what's allowed to be in place while you're on the job. So for example, requirements to wear masks or um, walking in a certain direction down a hallway or restricted access to certain areas based on the number of people already present in that area. These are all really hard set regulations that started to come into place that a number of individuals that um, our center works with found really difficult to immediately adjust to. And in some cases weren't necessarily understanding as quickly as needed to appease the requirements of the business. And so those individuals weren't able to adapt as quickly as needed and in many cases vocational support staff that would typically come in and assess the situation. So help that individual learn in a way that's, that's meaningful to them. So for example, using visual cues or um, trying to move plain language summaries into the workplace to help the individual learn what the new protocol is. That wasn't able to happen simply because jobs were restricting the number of people on site. And so, as you can imagine, this, this was really difficult because in the end, the services needed weren't provided to individuals with DD that even had remained um, within their job status. And that, of course, can have some really devastating effects. Um, obviously, job termination, and then if not job termination, even health risk. So individuals that, do, that are on the job, perhaps in a healthcare setting, do not have the vocational support to understand the new regulations, and then aren't wearing, for example, protective, personal protective equipment, they become even further at risk of contracting something like a pandemic illness. So again, we see a lot of kind of those collateral effects <clears throat> in the employment setting. And then thirdly, I just want to talk one last slide about employment. So Individuals with developmental disabilities, of course, inhabit all types of um, tiered levels of professions and those in the higher skilled jobs where they potentially could work remotely. And that's really what I mean by the higher skilled jobs. So 
Um, those that would involve more clerical work or more data entry or um, anything that would allow them to sort of telework, then also had to learn essentially how to perform their job, like many of us did, in a whole new way, using whole new technology. And that's anywhere from different teleconferencing software, how to you know, log in to document work during the day, um, any novel skills or, or um, pandemic related skills, for example, you know, at VCU, we had to, before we began work every day, even though it was, it was telework, um, log in and verify that we, you know, did not have any pandemic related symptoms. So I'm sure all of you have examples of this as well. So even moving to, to homework, there's a number of different challenges where individuals with developmental disabilities really needed additional support and services where they weren't necessarily getting in the way they needed. And then of course, the risk there is that, you know, businesses really needed to make some tough decisions, particularly when they were hit economically about who to keep on staff and who not to. And the risk that we are concerned about, of course, is that individuals with developmental disabilities that aren't getting the proper supports and services and aren't performing either to the new protocol um, requirements or maybe are as productive at home as they were on site because they don't have the tech skills and didn't adapt immediately to them or don't have the services to help them adapt immediately could likely make it on the chopping block disproportionately to other employees. So we want to make sure that we're really considering um, in the future, how to even out some of that discrepancy. So next I'm gonna talk a little bit about education. So certainly the field of education was hit uniformly hard by the pandemic. Um, it, basically unilaterally schools were shut down. And so nearly everybody moved to online. And early on in the pandemic, the CDC released a guidance in order to try and help K through 12 schools the best they could deal with some of the major priorities in order to establish sort of a certain minimum of services. And so I've just bulleted them here. Basically the priorities were that students would have access to technology. Of course, that's to enable them to, to access the curriculum. Um, that curriculums would be modified in e-learning platforms. And the CDC recommended that educators really think through ways to incorporate adult supervision and collaboration into tele-instruction. Certainly this is very difficult. Most parents were working from home. So it, these, are, these are well, very, um, you know, well in, intended, certainly didn't um, fit as perfectly as everyone would have hoped. And then finally, developing ways to troubleshoot technology failure. So everyone accessing the same types of tech platforms caused quite a, um, a chaos in, in just sort of jamming the internet. <laughs> and most schools or, or organizations tend to have a somewhat smaller tech support team they aren't used to having to deal with the entire community being online. And so they weren't as readily available just due to volume to help in the ways they needed. And so it really fell on educators to try to figure out ways to proactively prevent that or have backup or alternative assignments in the event of technology failure. And so again, these are just some of the ways the CDC tried to help educators figure out what it was they needed to focus on. And again, while that's good intended, I think some of the issues that came out really early on for educators was that um, educators couldn't often be online with students for the duration that they would have liked. And so that moved most students to a much more heavier focus on completing independent work. And we know with a lot of individuals with developmental disabilities that independent work can be very difficult for them. 
um, for lots of reasons. Sometimes it's motivation, sometimes it's concentration, sometimes they don't have the educational support they need. And so it became um, hard for those students to really adapt to that model. And then also students with developmental disabilities often learn in different ways than other students. So we know that they typically, um, well, we know that they do have individualized educational needs, of course, but that many of them need more hands-on instructional methods. So physical prompting or modeling, just to learn the different tasks they might need. And that's of course, extremely difficult to provide through um, any sort of teleconferencing software. Not only is the educator not present, but it relies on parents or caregivers who aren't trained in how to properly provide like a prompting hierarchy to a student. And so the, the quality of services, there's really a disconnect that happened between um, the context move from education to home. And then also some of the behavioral problems that students exhibit Many individuals do have behavior support plans and some informal techniques that <clears throat> are in place in the, the school setting, but those weren't designed for home settings. And so they didn't transfer the way that um, would most effectively support a student. We also saw the instances of, of new behavioral problems that arose once the student was at home and then there wasn't a support team in the way there had been in the school context to try and troubleshoot those. And then also um, it's not limited just to K through 12 populations, though I, I focused a lot on that. I do want to mention that colleges and universities serving individuals with um, any type of disability really had to rethink some of the accommodations and modifications they were providing. Colleges and universities are far more used to providing this via online formats, and so they didn't seem to experience quite the disconnect, but I do want to include them in this particular presentation, also because we do have a lot of students who have developmental disabilities that are duly enrolled, and so that's a place where um, a K-12 educator would really want to be uh, mindful of how their student might be doing if they are also trying to pursue coursework during their um, transition phase. And then I didn't put a note about it on this slide, but to speak a bit about transition students in general, we know from decades of research that transition age students who are employed or receive work experience during high school are far more likely to end up in competitive employment after high school. So it's about 3.8 times more likely that a student who has work experience in high school will ultimately become competitively employed um, at a one year point after they've left high school. And we know that those experiences really matter before the age of 21. So there's a, a very distinct window in which those work opportunities are necessary. And of course, during the pandemic, as I mentioned, not only were, were employment settings affected, but also education as well. And so most of the students weren't able to get quite like they would have otherwise that type of work preparation in an applied work setting. And so while it's fairly early on now, we don't know, of course, what the long-term effects of that might be, but it's certainly something we want to be concerned about because students with disabilities tend to have poor post-school outcomes compared to their peers without disabilities. And missing that critical window, particularly for employment, is majorly concerning. Okay. A lot of what we have talked about so far has really focused on some of the experiences that we've had, um, again, our center provides a lot of outreach and consultation, 
And we work from anywhere from K through 12 to young adults. And again, we work in employment settings, providing employment support. We work with students with behavioral disorders. We lend consult um, input for educational services. And of course, individuals, wherever, whatever context you work in, if they're affected in terms of um, medical supports or healthcare, you hear a lot about that as well. And probably everybody on this call is very familiar with the fact that, you know, once the pandemic really was called a pandemic and the world was scrambling to make sense of it, there was a lot of anecdotal information that was put out. And so some of the experiences that I've sort of just shared have a lot of relevance, but we didn't know much in terms of research for quite, quite a bit. Um, and it's only really been recently that peer-reviewed journals have started to really publish some evidence-based research studies to give us some more information about what some of the actual effects are scientifically of the pandemic on individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, so I want to present just kind of a quick overview of some of that current research and just help you as an audience if you haven't had a chance or, or don't necessarily have the interest to read through some of the, the peer review literature, it can be a bit dry at times, to have a kind of a condensed summary of just a few of the articles that came out to have a little more factual basis for what the current state of impact is for individuals with developmental disabilities. And if you do look at COVID-19 research, um, just a summary of what that looks like currently. So it is primarily survey or focus groups. And that is research that's able then to tap into a broad range of stakeholders, as Hannah will go over and myself, um, family members, siblings, educators, employers, researchers have all sort of been involved in this process. And it's happened fairly globally. So the research right now that we're seeing is coming out of um, fair, really all corners of the world. I mentioned here in the United Kingdom, the United States, Spain, Canada, South America. So really everybody is kind of finding a way to report on some of the different impacts or strategies they've found. I do want to caution, though, that we are obviously still really mapping the scope of the problem. So when you do get into the research, it's not as definitive as we would like. And that sort of goes into my next bullet point. The findings are really general. So we don't know a lot about specific populations. So for example, a different gender or race or even socioeconomic status. We don't have very specific findings. At this point, what's coming out, again, is very general and broad, but it's a good starting point. And so it's good for us all to sort of re recalibrate um, back away from what we, we think was the impact and more towards what we know is the impact. And we're at the, kind of the first rung of the ladder there. And so then again, we'll go over some preliminary strategies that have been identified. And then again, we don't know the long-term impact at this point, but the hope is that as research continues to come out, we'll get a better understanding of that. And that'll certainly help us in terms of where the gaps were during this incident and where to focus our strategies in the future. 